chronicles the painful failures of policy while also offering some solutions from a classical liberal perspective. Marcus Witcher and Rachel Ferguson argue that a political system ought to uphold individual rights, encourage voluntary exchange, and allow civil society to flourish. If you couldn't tell, I'm not an American, but I've always admired the United States and its history. It's a nation founded on enlightenment values and committed to individual rights and the rule of law. The founding of America was a unique event in human history, and it's best described by a question that the second president, John Adams, asked. He asked, how few of the human race have ever had an opportunity of choosing a system of government for themselves and their children? The United States we live in today is not the result of mere chance, but a conscious choice on behalf of the founders to create a new order of the ages. Unlike feudal Europe, built upon centuries of customs and hierarchy, America was founded upon principles. Principles found in documents like the Declaration of Independence. But being the first of its kind meant that Americans had no blueprint or roadmap to follow. Over the course of history, America has often fallen short of the promise of the Declaration of Independence, denying black Americans their birthright of freedom through the institution of slavery, the Dred Scott decision, Jim Crow laws, and modern day police brutality, all of which are an insult to the proposition that we are all born free and equal. Though advancements have been made, we cannot turn our eyes away from the past failures, especially when those failures continue to affect the prosperity, life, and liberty of black Americans to this day. But you didn't come here to listen to me talk, so instead, I'll introduce our guests. So first off, we have Marcus Witcher. He received his PhD in the University of Alabama and is currently an assistant professor at Huntington College. His research covers the economic, intellectual, sorry. <clears throat> his research covers the political, economic, and intellectual history from 1920 to the present day. He's author of the book, Getting, Reagan, sorry, Getting Right with Reagan, A Struggle for the Conservatism, 1980 to 2016. Rachel, Witcher, or <laughs> Rachel Ferguson received a PhD in philosophy from St. Louis University and is professor of Concordia University, Chicago. She is assistant dean of the College of Business and director of the Free Enterprise Center. Her work books the intersection of philosophy and economics of virtue. She's also an affiliate scholar at the Acton Institute. And finally, here to moderate our discussion is Amisha Cross, who wears many hats as a media host, a democratic strategist, and activist. She spent her career working in politics and policy, serving the Vice President Al Gore and former President Barack Obama. She's involved organizations such as the National Urban League and the NAACP. We're going to start off by Rachel giving us a quick introduction to the broad overview of the book. Then Amisha will take over asking questions. At the hour mark, we're going to take questions from the audience, both in person and online. If you want to ask a question online, please use the hashtag KiddoEvents. And thanks again for coming. Hope you enjoy and learn something new. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I'll just start out by saying sort of how we were inspired to take up this project. Uh, Marcus and I are both classical liberal scholars. And uh, you know, if you run in those circles, you know that classical liberals have a lot of great insights on race and discrimination really important work that's been done in economics and the history of economics. Um, but we're not necessarily known for that, are we? Uh, people don't necessarily associate classical liberals with as a great resource uh, for thinking about race and discrimination. And we wanted to solve that by bringing together a lot of the great insights that classical liberals have. We thought that that would also serve another purpose, which is to sort of address some of this tribalism and polarization that we're experiencing in our country right now. Uh, as classical liberals, we sometimes agree with conservatives and we sometimes agree with progressives. It depends on the issue. And so having that ability to be uh, politically homeless, to be outside of the tribes, to bust out of those categories and unbundle one issue from another, we felt could really serve us well in thinking about the history of black America in particular, because black Americans as well do not fit well into the political categories of the majority culture. And so uh, we, we thought it gave us a great opportunity. The first thing you have to do when thinking through the history of black America, of course, is to address the relationship between markets and slavery. And so immediately as we jump into the book, we take a look at uh, the new historians of capitalism who are kind of rolling the idea of markets into all of the different forms of oppression like colonialism uh, and imperialism. And we're saying we really have to separate these out. We have to go back to Adam Smith. We have to go back to John Stuart Mill, who knew not only how immoral slavery is, because it's a violation of your most fundamental property right, your right in your own body, but also how economically foolish it is. Anytime 
that we take a, a group of people in our population and we don't allow them to improve their human capital. We don't allow them to move around to where their labor is most needed. We don't allow them to invent things and sell them. Uh, we are all losers. So yes, did a few southern planters get rich? Yes, of course they did. But that's not what free markets do. Free markets don't make a few aristocratic types rich. Free markets make regular people richer. They make the lives of regular people better off. And regular southerners weren't better off. They were worse, worse off. Even poor white southerners uh, had their wages dragged down uh, by the fact that they were competing with those who were enslaved. And of course, the lives of the enslaved were ruined uh, by their slave masters in many ways. As we go on, though, we look at emancipation and we see that after emancipation, black Americans are so excited about the possibility of owning land and owning farms. But of course, we all know how that story went. They were not given any land in compensation for all of the stolen labor. And so they went on to enter into sharecropping. And one of the things we noticed there is that while so many of their rights were still being abrogated, courts were not really recognizing their property rights or their freedom of contract. They had one very precious right, and it was the right to leave. It was the freedom of movement. Because you could threaten to go, because you could move from the deep south to the upper south, because you could remove yourself from that farm and go over to that farm, over a few decades you saw the formerly enslaved freedmen now bidding up their wages, or in this case their shares, uh, quite a bit. And even though they're starting from a very low point, you actually see black incomes rise at two and a half or three times as, as fast as white incomes at that time. So there is some catching up happening there. But we also see an amazing flourishing of black civil society. Uh, we see the uh, rise of educational efforts, particularly coming out of the church. And we see one of possibly one of the most amazing leaps forward in literacy in the history of the world thus far, going from basically zero at emancipation to 80% by 1930. I mean, it's quite stunning. And there are just efforts everywhere in this regard. Uh, so that's a kind of positive story. But as we go on this roller coaster ride through black American history, we have to stop and look at the atrocities uh, against black Americans. Some of them are quite famous, like the thousands of lynchings that occurred. But others are not as well known, like convict leasing, in which black men in particular were just criminalized with many laws that didn't even make sense, uh, like vagrancy laws that treated you like uh, a criminal just for standing around and not having a job or not being able to prove that you have a job. Uh, I could go on and on about the ridiculous crimes that these men were charged with, but the worst part is that they were then leased out to mines and farms as workers, and because they weren't owned, they weren't even seen as an investment, and so they were treated even worse than they were treated under slavery, and many of them simply died. They were treated so badly that if any kind of sickness came through the camp, 20, 30, and sometimes even 40% of the men in the camps would die. This happened to tens of thousands of black American men. It's an absolute tragedy, and there are many other atrocities that we deal with in that chapter, including things like the massacre in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We turn then to a more positive story looking at the history of the black church. We see how black Americans really identified with the idea of being made in the image of God, right? Having the same equal status uh, with their white brothers and sisters. We see them identifying with the story of the Exodus and uh, being released from slavery, that dream of freedom. And we see them identifying with the prophets who care for the poor and the widow and the orphan and stranger, and they feel cared for by God. We see how the black church becomes like the cultural womb of black America in which so many other forms of networks, including uh, business leagues and mutual aid societies and literacy efforts and school efforts, all flow out of that wonderful, thick civil society institution. And then in chapter six, we take a look at black entrepreneurship, beginning with the great Booker T. Washington. Of course, Washington gets kind of panned as an accommodationist sometimes, given his debate with W.E.B. Du Bois. And of course, being in the Deep South, he did have to be very careful about what he said. He was in actual physical danger uh, from being assassinated if he spoke out of turn. But uh, secretly, Booker T. Washington was actually funding a lot of the great legal efforts for political rights 
as he was working on getting blacks into positions where they could uh, be owning property, starting businesses, and really flourishing economically. And so we try to tell a longer story of civil rights that starts with the business community and the churches who are building up a black uh, middle and upper class that are then able to be the lawyers and the funders of the fight for civil rights later on. So we, we really see Booker T. Washington as uh, playing a part there that he doesn't always get credit for. And we go on to talk about the wonderful stories of Madam C.J. Walker, of course, John H. Johnson, the very brave uh, publisher who put the picture of Emmett Till into Ebony and Jet magazine. Uh, and of course, T.R.M. Howard, the great black hospitaler who protected the family of Emmett Till during their trial and uh, was a mentor to Medgar Evers and Fannie Lou Hamer. So that's just a wonderful uh, reflection on what black Americans were able to accomplish despite all of the ridiculous obstacles that were being put in their way. Then as we move on, we take a look at um, some of the really egregious, uh, the egregious eugenicist views of the progressive era, where right at the turn of the century, you know, it's sometimes underestimated just how popular these eugenicist ideas were, the notion of racial superiority and inferiority on a pseudo-scientific basis. And from there, we see the rise of the minimum wage, the idea of the minimum wage, and the notion that we can disemploy certain people so that the white Aryan head of household can be supported by the economy and everyone else can just kind of fade away. A uh, really sick and strange philosophy. And we go on to see how the progressives push for massive social engineering projects, like in the way that the Federal Housing Administration used redlining to keep black neighborhoods and white neighborhoods separate, along with immigrant neighborhoods as well. Uh, they go on to use that, that social engineering mindset uh, to build the federal highway system, right? And so as municipal leaders are given millions of dollars to decide where these highways go, instead of putting them through some industrial area that won't affect anybody, they decide purposefully to put them right through the black economic centers in so many American cities and Latino centers out west. And uh, it's a terrible case of eminent domain abuse with property rights being violated. And of course, the really tragic part of this story is the way in which the civil society institutions, the business districts, the schools, the churches, the networks are just blown apart by blowing apart these uh, neighborhood centers. And it's only made worse by urban renewal, which James Baldwin called Negro removal, because uh, the same thing was done by taking away people's property, and in many cases, not even compensating them as the Constitution requires. And so we go on to look at the, the effect of the great society. Um, we agree with many conservatives who see the terrible disincentives in the way that our welfare system is arranged, uh, the perverse incentives against work and marriage. We agree with that critique, but we also sort of challenge our conservative friends to be just as hard on other forms of welfare, like corporate welfare, which will also cause all sorts of malinvestment. Uh, and uh, dysfunction in the economy. Uh, and we go on to look at other social factors. And then by the end of the book, we're, we're coming up to the present day and we're looking at the rise of the drug war, we're looking at mass incarceration. At this point, we're looking at things in America that are actually not specifically black issues because they're affecting all Americans, but we're gonna hear from black people about them more because black people are disparately affected, sometimes because of race and sometimes because of class, because they're overrepresented below the poverty line. And so we shouldn't be surprised when we hear about this, particularly from the black community. And so we look at creative market solutions to thinking um, better about how we can deal with the mass incarceration crisis. And of course, we wanna end the drug war. And throughout the book, as we're going through uh, kind of the history, we drop in two things. One are lessons in classical liberalism, where we just take uh, advantage of moments where we can explain various things about classical liberalism in a way that's very easily understood by a popular audience. So if you have friends who aren't familiar <laughs> with classical liberalism, this is a great way to help them out. And then we also drop in solutions, including economic freedom, educational freedom, criminal justice reform, those things I assume you're somewhat familiar with, 
But the two that you may be less familiar with are transitional justice, which is uh, an idea that has to do with healing huge society-wide massive injustices. And one of the main things we focus on there is the idea of institutional memory. We think the conservatives and libertarians should be just as excited about going into our local histories and really telling the stories of the survivors and those who were harmed by our racist policies historically because it's so important for our healing process. If we don't tell the truth, we will never be able to reconcile. And then finally, neighborhood stabilization is the idea that no matter if we get every single policy we want and we get everything in place that we think is right politically, some of these neighborhoods, particularly in our very isolated inner cities, are so destabilized that there's a gap in terms of bandwidth. You have people who would love to take advantage of all the things that are being provided, but have too much to contend with. And I call it network poverty, right? They're so isolated from the employment networks, for instance, that they need to take advantage of. The only solution to this is a bottom-up solution. We need a decentralized solution in which individual people and groups and philanthropic efforts are on the ground walking through life with people surrounding neighbors with the resources that we all take for granted right the kinds of networks that we take for granted that's a labor of love that's not something a policy or a check in the mail or a government office can do but it's what we've got to do and i'm very excited to inform you that it's already being done by people like bob lupton in atlanta with his focus community strategies by the great John Perkins of the Christian Community Development Association, Bob Woodson, who many of you know. Uh, Brian Fickert wrote a wonderful book called When Helping Hurts, where he deals with flipping our philanthropic model and really empowering people and dignifying them by treating them as not just as recipients, right, who I'm gonna sort of drop my gift on your head, but rather as someone with whom I want to exchange. And so it's an important kind of paradigm shift that I think we all need to think about in our philanthropic models. So I'll stop there and then we'll get started with the questions. Absolutely, I think that that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Very happy to be here with both Marcus and Rachel. You guys did an amazing job with this book. Um, we cannot underscore that enough. It is a very thorough and quite frankly, um, in depth vision of and understanding of black America, not only in terms of history, but also up through present day, one in which even those of us who have grown up in those communities, who are of that community and have been through that school system, quite frankly, don't always get as in depth as that. So just giving you that off the top. Thank you. With that being said, we were missed to say that we are not in the midst of um, celebrating Juneteenth. So there couldn't have been a better time for this to be hosted. So thank you to Cato for that. There are several things within this book that I found quite profound in the ways that you state them as well as the examples that you utilize. One of the top things for me is looking at black America as well as the vision of America as a whole. When we talk about the American dream, there are all of these idealistic goals. There is this, um, this euphoria of sorts about being American and what that means and the promise and the future that it holds. Something that has largely been kept away from black America, quite frankly, since our inception in this country. With that being said, a great deal of what you talk about is within the business ownership entrepreneurship space. As you, as you know, uh, business ownership and entrepreneurship has been such a large and impactful part of the black community for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, the only way that many black Americans are ever able to compete or have any extent of capital for their own families and communities. But with that being said, there are just so many impediments to actually owning your own business, building that, as well as getting the capital to get it started and avoiding some of the pitfalls that, quite frankly, government institutions have put in place when it comes to black business and black business ownership. Currently, black women hold the most black businesses of any demographic in the country. However, the gains, the potential gains of that have not been seen. Black women are also the population that has the least amount of wealth in this country. From your, from your book, you speak about entrepreneurship as this gateway to opportunity, but also as one that has been built over time um, as it relates to black people being able to have to have access. Mm -hmm. How do you translate that into what is being seen today? Because entrepreneurship is continually pressed throughout the community. That's mm -hmm. something that, um, regardless of what party you stand for, entrepreneurship is something that I feel as though the black community definitely jumps a hold of. Yeah. But with that being said, they aren't necessarily seeing that, those same gains, even though the numbers in terms of black entrepreneurship are there. Yeah. Me? Um, 
Yeah, so w we first take a look at some of the policy issues that we could address, and that's in the economic freedom section. Uh, we draw a lot on Michael Tanner's book, The Inclusive Economy, which I highly recommend. Uh, there are so many things about the way our system is set up that rewards people who are already established, who are already rich, and is hard on people who are trying to start. Uh, for instance, we reward rich people for saving, but we punish poor people for saving. So if you try to save something up, you're, you, will, you will lose certain benefits, right? And there's a lot of little things like that, um, uh, you know, stacked policies that we could change to really change the incentive structure. We also look at things like occupational licensing reform. Um, these small businesses don't need more hoops to jump through. A middle class person may take for granted that, you know, yeah, it takes weeks and weeks to get this done, right? And, I have to ask five friends to help me fill out this paperwork, but no big deal, I can get it done. But imagine if you're an inner city entrepreneur. You may not have those five friends. You may not have weeks and weeks before you need, that you can wait before you start making a profit. And so we need to lower all of those sorts of regulatory barriers for people who want to start their own businesses. And a great example was the Tennessee law in which barbers had to have a high school diploma. Why? What does, what does having a high school diploma have to do with being good at cutting hair? Nothing. But what you see is really crony capitalism, right? Cronyism, in which rent seeking, whatever you want to call it, privilege seeking, in which established, notice, a local salon doesn't have to be a big business. They could be a small business, but they're an established business. So the established business can go and say, hey, doesn't, don't they have to have a, a high school diploma? You need to add that. Or doesn't that African hair braider have to go to cosmetology school so that she has to work at my salon and I get to take off the top you know, from her profits? Well, no, she shouldn't have to do that. And so we have to fight really hard in our state legislatures uh, and at the local level to make sure that we're removing every barrier we possibly can. But I also want to return to that point about neighborhood stabilization to say, you know, sometimes we can't wait. We can't wait for those barriers to come down. My friend Shamed Dogan in Missouri worked on African hair braining for years before he got that removed. So what do we have to do? We have to come up from below, bring our own networks and our own resources into the inner city entrepreneurs and help lift them up above the barriers, right? By, by giving them the bandwidth that we have. So part of that is philanthropic. But then I just wanna end by reminding everyone, and I'm always really careful to say this, 80% of black America is above the poverty line. The majority of black Americans are middle class. They are on their way, right? And so black Americans are tracking in terms of income, not caught up in terms of wealth, which is more complicated, so we can talk about that. But when I'm talking about things like neighborhood stabilization, I'm talking about those who have been left behind, those who are stuck economically. Most of black America is not stuck uh, economically, and that's important to say. No, absolutely. I'm glad yeah. that you added that context. Um, for the re-entry population, Marcus, um, which is a population that happens to, in many cases, be stuck by no fault of their own, um, the idea of re-entry is that you've paid your debt to society, so you come out, and now you're able to go back into that society. Um, and there are significant barriers, whether you're finding housing issues, in many cases, even getting a driver's license, getting access to your personal documents, identification documents. But the biggest barrier is actually job access. So we see that there are more people who have re-entered society who get all the doors slammed in their faces when they're trying to apply for jobs. Um, so they have taken the entrepreneurship on in a much different way because the idea is that they cannot apply for and actually get accepted to traditional work. Mm -hmm. Even those who have had, um, who have had education while they were in, in, in prison or in any other form of det detention. So they have credentials, but they're still not able to get mm -hmm. jobs. For those individuals who have different barriers to job access, what does entrepreneurship look like? And how, has, how have states, or how do you think states should manage that? Because this is a significant population of individuals who come out of jails or prison systems every year, mm -hmm. and quite frankly, have no place else to turn. Yeah, as a historian, I'm much more comfortable talking about the ways in which we got to where we are, rather than talking about certain sort of prescriptions. I generally mm -hmm. leave those for Rachel to sort of prescribe what we should do today. Um, but having said that, I think there's been a lot of good work done, and surprisingly, in some southern states, right? Yeah. States like Texas, uh, Kansas, one of the uh, Georgia, Georgia, Kansas, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, you know, to try and um, you know attack sort of the mass incarceration mm -hmm. crisis and try and help people as they transition into sort of normal life. And I think one of the things that we try to do in the book is we want to speak to conservatives in a way that says, listen, these are past injustices. Whether we use the term social justice, or we just use the term past injustice, these are past injustices that we need to address. They're wrongs that were done. 
um, and to try and give them a vocabulary and speak in a way that will get them to recognize that there is a problem with mass incarceration. I think that we see that happening already, mm -hmm. right? It's already beginning to happen, and the numbers are beginning to fall. Um, as far as sort of what we can do for those folks to help them re-enter, um, Rachel, do you have any specific ideas on like yeah. policies that can be pursued? Yeah, so one of the things we do in the book is we try to direct you to other great books. Yeah. Um, and we're drawing on those, and those who are interested in particular issues can go deeper. And so one of the ones we look at is uh, Ending Over Criminalization and Mass Incarceration by Anthony Bradley. Mm -hmm. And the subtitle is Hope from Civil Society. Because what he's saying is, look, you have a government-run prison system, so it's terrible, right? It makes things worse rather than better. The only hope you're going to have is from civil society. And so he goes through many examples of groups that came in and made sure that kids didn't go into juvenile uh, you know, delinquency in the first place, right? Um, so that they didn't get into that uh, crime cycle. Uh, the groups that met uh, prisoners six months before they got out, right, and started making sure that they were making the transition. Um, business people who were actually bringing work into the prisons with real wages, not just the federal wages, right, with real wages. I mean, these guys were getting on the phone to do their homework with their kids because they could afford to pay for the call because they had a real job in the prison. I mean, really creative stuff. And then, of course, to go back to neighborhood stabilization, getting these kids before they ever get there, mm. right? And so finding these kids when they're 12, 13, 14 years old, not taking them out of their neighborhood, bringing opportunities into the neighborhood, the community gardens, right? The woodworking, the lawn mowing, so that a kid by 13, 14, 15 years old is already getting paid and knowing how to show up to work and be responsible and deal with it when they don't feel like it and all of the things that are just hard about being a teenager, right? And so that that kid is already on their way to school or job rather than into the gang life, which is in many cases almost inevitable in some neighborhoods. And so it's really important to go back to the root as well. And civil society is a common thread. It's a common theme throughout the book. Um, and as it relates to the black community particularly, it's not a buzzword even though the activities or the activities of it have been seen throughout history. Where do you see civil society as it, as it takes place today, specifically looking at your chapter on the black church? Um, as we know, church attendance in general has gone down, particularly amongst the millennial generation, and we don't have that much, um, that we don't have that much look to look forward to with the next generation either, <laughs> um, as it relates to people going to church on a regular basis and being involved at that level. Where do you see civil society playing in those types of institutions currently? Yeah, so civil society is like the missing piece, right? We talk about markets, we talk about the state, and we always forget all of our lives happen in civil society, most of our life, 90%, right? Happens in civil society and all of our voluntary associations. And so while it's true that, um, you know, the rise of the nuns, right, the church going and things like that are going down, um, black Americans are the most religious demographic in the United States. They still are. The millennials are more religious than, black millennials are more religious than white millennials. Uh, more likely to pray, more likely to believe in God, read the Bible, etc. And so uh, the black church is still a strong influence in the black community, uh, you know, even though that struggle is occurring and how are we going to shift into maybe other civil society institutions, I think is an important question. One of the things, which is a somewhat provocative thing we suggest in the book, is that if we had school choice, if we had educational freedom, maybe the black church would be empowered to do for many black kids what the Catholic church did for many immigrant kids, right? And that would be a huge boon, I think, of empowering the black church to do what they did all along, right? Which was the wonderful black education. I, I also think one of the things as a historian that I think we've lost over the course of the last 40 or 50 years is, is this belief in civil society. I think you know, there are many books that have been written about sort of the decline of civil society, the decline of community as we sort of move into sort of a more advanced technology, internet, et cetera. But one of the things that we really try to capture in the book, and I hope it's one of the things that resonates for a new generation of activists who want to achieve um, equality, is the amount of work that civil society, that was done in civil society to build towards the civil rights movement. There were massive protests in 1905 that Booker T. Washington supported, uh, sort of on the down low, not actively, because he didn't want people to come and storm Tuskegee. But um, that he had supported, but they ultimately failed. The boycotts failed in like 1904, 1905. 
Um, and as a historian, you have to ask yourself, like, well, why did they fail in 1905, but they succeeded in 1955 in Montgomery? And the answer to that is in that chapter on black entrepreneurship, right? Mm -hmm. And that chapter on black entrepreneurship isn't just about businessmen and women going out there and making and becoming millionaires like Madam C.J. Walker. <laughs> it is a book about how um, civil society organizations such as the Black Elks, seemingly, you know, people coming together to band together to create an insurance. A, a co-op for themselves, where people would pay in, and then they would have life insurance. They'd have, um, they would also have sort of if you got sick, you know, you, you get sick. Okay, we're all going to go over to Misha's house and make sure Misha's actually sick. And if she is, then we'll go ahead and pay her day's wages, right? And someone might pop in from the Elks, you know, a week later just to make sure you were on the mend and whatnot. Um, but it provided a means by which, in you know, in, in, without sort of access to those white institutions or without government, which is this pre-welfare state, giving those access, they created their own civil society, their or own organizations that enabled them to have those types of um, sort of social, this sort of safety net, right? And the Black Elks were so much more than just that. They also provided African Americans with their first opportunity at like political activity. I mean, as many African Americans got this after opportunity during sort of radical reconstruction, but by 1873, that opportunity is pretty much, by 1876, is definitely gone uh, across the South. And so they offered an opportunity for black men, uh, usually, but there were also uh, female associations, uh, to come together to vote, to, act, to become sort of active in their communities, to, to earn sort of a, a role. And then they began educating, right? And so the work of the Elks, the work of the churches, the work of the businessmen and women, the NAACP, right, which is an organization that's built out of civil society that borrowed, actually, many of its lawyers came from the Elks who had to fight in the courts mm -hmm. because white uh, fraternal societies didn't want black fraternal societies to use their, quote unquote, their name, right? Mm -hmm. So all of these law, many of the early NAACP lawyers actually grow up or get their sort of, you know, experience fighting these cases. And so we see over the course of that 50 years, what might seem mundane, but is really the stuff that changes the world, which is the small, small activity by these civil society organizations that built up a foundation upon which civil rights activists like Martin Luther King Jr. and others could get donations, they could get support, they could call on people, right, to help them as they, in the 1950s, right, were actually successful in carrying out these types of boycotts, et cetera. So mm -hmm. I think civil society is immensely important, and one of the things I hope that a younger generation sort of takes away from this is that um, change doesn't happen overnight, right? It's gradual, it can sometimes be slow, agonizingly slow. Um, but join a club, right? Uh, be a part of your community. Like, meet people, like, beyond just, like, TikTok or whatever it is that young people do today, <laughs> right? Um, and so I hope there's a, a sort of a, a, an appreciation for civil society that comes out of those chapters. I really appreciate the moment you took, well, not the TikTok shape, but the moment, <laughs> the moment you took to talk about the progress, because progress and, and change is often slow. And I think that every generation assumes that the generation before them was able to get things done at a much faster pace. Um, a lot of younger people look back at the civil rights movement and they see these young African Americans who are on the front lines and they think, okay, well, if they were able to move this piece in this amount of time, not recognizing that people have been working on that for 40, 50, 60 plus mm -hmm. years before them, and they came in and they took some of the lessons from the past, but they also adapted them to a television modern era at the time, and now you're seeing young people adapt them to the digital space mm -hmm. because that's where the action is. But the civil society, as you, as you phrase it, um, the idea that these things are started at the local level, at a very bare bones level, at a level that does not have a hierarchical structure, as one that allows for innovation, as one that allows for a bridge to actually have direct impact in communities, whether that is through education models, or whether that is through programs that allow you to feed the hungry, or take care of their health care, or ensure that they have those benefits. I think that those are all things that um, members of any community would jump on, but especially the black community, because regardless of who's in office, R in front of your name, D in front of your name, lucky for whoever the independent is who gets it sometimes, <laughs> but it hasn't necessarily moved the needle towards the types of progress that those communities need, specifically those in your ultra-urban or strongly rural areas. I'm a native of Chicago, and at the end of the day, there's been election after election, and right now, they're actually having a primary, and the largest voting district happened to be the Cook County Jail. No one came out to vote. And the city is wondering why. And we're like, well, violence, really bad schools, not many options to go to schools outside of your community. In addition to an extreme level of poverty, the highest black male unemployment in the entire nation. And an economic system where it is also the lowest economic outcomes in the state of Illinois for black people anywhere in America. So when you have those things set up, which I was shocked by that last one because I definitely thought it would have been in the South, 
was completely wrong. Um, there isn't an incentive, or people feel like there's no incentive. They're living this every day. There's no incentive to get out and vote because nothing changes no matter who's in office. When you have that type of setup, which happens in communities across the country, the idea of a civil society is something that is, quite frankly, appealing. Mm -hmm. What would you say to people who are not yet involved or are looking to engage? How do they themselves create this system? Can I jump in and make another comment first, just as you're talking? Um, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Go ahead, Marcus, I'll co come back to it. No, I mean, so sorry, can you repeat the question? So how do you create this type of system for individuals who are interested? Because we hear it time and time again. They don't feel like there's change in the yeah. communities. They have been fighting for a very long time. They need to ensure that they have schools that are capable, that there is health care that is available, that there is housing options. Oh, yeah. And there was a time in history, as you alluded to in the book, where there were co-ops, there were organizations that came together and made this happen because outside of government has largely been the only way that many black communities have been able to survive all of this. Yeah, yeah. The, the comment I was going to make real quickly, sorry, it came it's back okay. to me as you were saying, is that I think it, it, your question gets at the heart of sort of this push and pull that we have between the left and the right right now which is where the right wants to sort of say, none of, none of this has anything to do with our history of racial injustice. And the left wants to say, all of it has to do with our history of racial injustice. And one of the points we want to make in the book is that racial injustice is the thing that gets the ball rolling. But then as the ball is rolling, it starts causing these other things, which include breakdown of civil society institutions, right? So that's where you get some of the things conservatives talk about, like family structure breakdown and so forth. And those things are real. And then the question is, how do we solve those problems? Well, sending everyone to anti-racist training doesn't necessarily solve it, not only because anti-racist trainings are kind of famous for not working, but also... Also, black people didn't ask for that. <laughs> black people didn't ask for that. But also, you're going back to that, that um, non-proximate cause, right, way back there, rather than the proximate cause, which may, may be something like, I need a mentor to help me learn how to parent, right? I need a mentor to help me start that business. And so that's why I think, in many ways, if conservatives and libertarians could be better about telling the history people would feel more compelled by their actual suggestions for what to do right now because we would be giving that nuanced story of the way that it's like a domino effect from racism and then into the effect on civil society institutions. There you go. Yeah, I think your question about you know how do normal, everyday, average Americans make a difference um, I think that, I mean, I think it's quite, it's actually quite simple. I mean, the answer is, I was, the other day I went out to lunch with um, a colleague of mine, and she is very invested in, in, in Montgomery, and her neighborhood in Montgomery, and she said, I was really excited, really excited about all this talk about neighborhood stabilization in St. Louis, because uh, Rachel is connected with Love the Lou, which is doing amazing work, that's going block by block, revitalizing sort of the, you know, Enride Boulevard, right? Like, yeah. you know, sort of the rougher, like, blocks. Mm -hmm. And she goes, how could I do that here in Montgomery? She's the spark, right? She's the person who's like, I want to do something. And I have a church. And she says, you know, we have the resources in our church. We've been doing charity for so many years wrong, right? Mm -hmm. We've been, we, have, we have resources. Whether you're in a white church, a black church, a multi-ethnic church, like there are resources. There are network connections. If you're not in a church, that can be drawn in. And she's like, how do I, how do I get the ball rolling? She was sort of like asking me that question. And you know, I said, you should talk to Rachel <laughs> because Rachel knows way more about it than I do about like, the specifics of how you get that started. But I think it starts with conversations, right? Conversations about, all right, you're enthusiastic. You've got the energy, you're excited. You want to live in the community, which she does, right? She bought her home, her and her husband did, in the community rather than, you know, like I live in a suburb of mm -hmm. Montgomery. She invested in a home in the community because she wants to make a difference in the community. And now what we need to do and what I need to do is I need to set up a Zoom call with Rachel and maybe Rachel can explain it and maybe we can set up a Zoom call with Lucas who does the hard work in St. Louis, uh, who's the person who's in the actual neighborhood, right? And talk about what are the, the, the impediments? What are the sort of things that you have to jump over in order to get this done? And then there are people like me who would be super enthusiastic about helping with a project like this who don't feel called to live necessarily. I don't think I'm made of that metal to live in the, in the actual neighborhood. But, but I have, you know, and maybe I should be shamed for that, but um, I do have other skills, right? Like I hypothetically, you know, you know I talk to, I teach people supposedly uh, in classes and stuff. So I can, you know, um, you know, I can tutor, I can help uh, sort of mentor kids. Um, 
You know, I can, you know, like you always say, like you can drive, you know, a kid to go like see his dad if his dad happens to be, you know, incarcerated. Like there are things that every single one of us can do. If you're a lawyer, right, you can come and help people who have questions about law, the, le the legality of how do you start a, a business. Mm -hmm. Connecting those folks to the networks that, like Rachel said, we take for granted. I mean, this sounds like a lot of work, and I think it is for the person who actually is invested in the neighborhood. I think it takes a special type of person. But for the rest of us, like it might just be five hours of your week, right? Um, it might be the equivalent. Of, it might be less than tithing in terms of you know the amount of money that you contribute to the cause. But if you get enough people who care about right revitalizing Montgomery and improving its schools and other things like that, then you can make a tremendous, tremendous difference. And then, of course, the other thing you can actually do is become politically active in your in in, in local elections. You know, like you, everybody gets excited about presidential elections, but if you really want to make a difference, like the local level is where you can actually make a difference, um, where your vote might actually, it carries more weight, uh, just statistically, right? It carries more weight than it would at the federal level. And so like become active, go to the school board meetings, like advocate for school choice, right? If you believe in that cause, which I do, right? Um, and I think that over, over time through neighborhood stabilization, I'm a huge school choice advocate. Like, I think school choice is probably the most important, single most important policy that we could implement to um, sort of to address, to address the these past, issues. Yeah, yeah but uh, but you know, we can talk maybe more about that in a little bit. But I think that's what you can do. I've gone on long enough, no, but I think that's what you can do. You just gotta you have to be the change. I know that's cliche, but like we all have something that we can contribute. And you definitely walked into what was going to be my next topic. <laughs> um, so school choice has so many different tentacles and it gets people fired up on the left, the right, and in the middle. Um, people who have kids, people who don't have kids, people who have kids in the system, people who have kids outside of the system. Um, with that being said, when most people hear school choice, they either think charter schools or they think vouchers. The school choice argument is a lot more than that. And the idea of school choice is one that, as, as somebody who does identify as a liberal, as somebody who's well, voted for Democrats and works for Democrats, I've always stood on school choice. Um, my mom homeschooled me when I was a kid, and then I went to a public high school for high school, and I went to a Christian university for college. I believe that at the end of the day, um, the communities that my family was afforded to live in because my mom was a single mom would not have provided us the best opportunities educationally. And we, we had this discussion in, in before the green room around the fact that there are Schools should not, the quality of your school should not be determined by your zip code, how much your family makes, or the color of your skin. And sadly, across this country, it is. There are great variances depending on where you live, depending on the income of your family, depending on, quite frankly, the color of the predominant uh, students in that building. That becomes a very hard thing to sell. And I have had several discussions with union members, some of those quite heated and very vocal. Uh, there are things that they say that are problematic with the idea that you can basically wait it out. I don't have children, but if I did have a child, you cannot tell me that I can wait for 10, 12, 14 years for your school to maybe get it together. And I don't even know in this context what get it together means because there's literally 500 things going wrong. So if you fix one, we're still kind of screwed. With that being said, school choice is still a hot button topic. And I think largely it is because of Sometimes having faulty charter school administrators or people who have single sites that come up and do some shady things and then leave. But also, many people don't fully understand the provisions of school choice and what that actually means. The idea of homeschooling is just now taking another turn just because of the crisis that we saw during the pandemic and students being forced to be at home with their families. But school choice and, and homeschooling in general had a stigma to it for quite some time around ultra-religious people who didn't necessarily want to have their young people around the predominant culture. And it was also one that was seen as more only white people do this. Where do you think we are today? And where is this school choice, um, school choice argument going to go? We know that in the previous administration, there was a large amount of hurrah around school choice. Right now, we're seeing some of those things pull back. States are fighting back and forth as to how far they're going to allow school choice to go, who has their various provisions depending on where you live. It's not going to change anytime too soon. Parents want a certain level of autonomy. They want to know what their children are learning. There is a rift right now between school choice and obviously CRT, which we'll talk about the culture wars later. But for this question, when it comes to school choice, where do you see this going as a policy matter, and why is it such an important part of civil society? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, I think this is the moment, okay? This is the moment for school choice. The next two to four years is going to be really, really important for what happens to the educational, sort of the future educational system in the United States. This is the moment for school choice. So if you care about school choice, like we should be like trying to knock down the doors, knock down the impediments, push on every single state legislature. This is the justice issue of our, it is a justice issue, it is a, it's something we have to get done. And it's something that conservatives and libertarians should be advocating for, but it's also something that um, black parents have been advocating for. I think, what's the approval rating among Six, minority parents? It's 60 like- 60 to 70%. 60 to 70%. This is opposed by teachers unions. Um, but I mean, the basic concept, right, is you're gonna introduce competition into education, right? If you, uh, you're gonna introduce competition through competition, you're gonna lower the cost, you're gonna increase the quality. That's how competition works, despite uh, sort of criticisms of market processes. That's how competition works, okay? And if we do that in schools, we're gonna empower parents, um, we're going to empower students. And I just wanna say, like, for my progressive friends, like, in many of these places, things can't get any worse. It can't get any worse. It, it absolutely can't get any worse. I mean, we have like the Montgomery school systems, I think every single one of the schools, the public schools, not the magnet, not the, not the char your charter schools, not the, every one of them is like the lowest ranking you could possibly get. And they've been that way for an extended period of time. Spending, I don't know the specific spending numbers in Montgomery, but spending numbers on education over the course of the last 40 years have gone up dramatically, adjusted for inflation, of course. Um, outcomes remain completely stagnant. What we're doing is not working. And so what I often tell you know, my progressive friends is like, let's give this a shot. Let's give this a shot. We already have evidence that uh, charter schools perform better than public schools. Um, it may not be as good, we've talked about this, the data in some places as we'd like it to be. Um, but they also compete, they're better on the margins of other things. Rachel, I don't know if you wanna talk about those things, but. Yeah, I mean, mental and physical well-being is extremely important to parents. And so even if you don't see test scores shooting up, some charter schools you do, but in some charter schools, you see, oh, they do a little better, but you know, why should we take this risk if there's only a marginal change? Because test scores isn't the only thing that matters, right? It also matters that your child you know, um, doesn't get pregnant until after high school or doesn't uh, get bullied to the point of a mental breakdown, uh, right? Or maybe your kid is a little different from other kids um, and, and they're not fitting in. And so it's really important to parents to have safety both mentally and physically in their schools, and you're seeing amazing outcomes out of charter schools in that regard, uh, where you have many fewer students getting involved in the criminal justice system, you have better outcomes in terms of teen pregnancy, et cetera. And so I think that's what parents really value, but if you come at it from you know, the outside culture, you're not necessarily understanding what's at play there. Uh, yeah, so I, I agree totally with Marcus. I think there's been 27 states that passed some kind of school choice legislation. The pandemic just pulled, you know, pulled the blanket off, right? I mean, we all saw what was underneath. And I think the exciting thing is markets create variety. Mm -hmm. um, kids are unique, unrepeatable individuals. And we need educational systems that feed their special callings, right? And what we have is a one-size-fits-all ham-fisted system. And the worst part of all, go back to everything I said earlier at the beginning about highways, about FHA redlining, about urban renewal. We ghettoized poor black people and now we're asking them to set up their school districts based on a zip code that is totally geographically unjust. So all we're doing is perpetuating the injustices that we did in the 70s, right? And th that makes it that much worse. And so I think we just have to make it possible for these students to go elsewhere. And there's a million different ways to do it. There's hybrid, right? There's these um, special tax refund things, right? I, I don't even remember all the names of the different kinds of things you can do. Um, there's a lot besides charters that you can do in terms of school choice. And I think now it's busting open and people are getting more entrepreneurial and realizing that we can go in a lot of different directions and create all kinds of schools that serve different kinds of students. And we don't even know what, we don't even know what the alternative necessarily is to the public education apparatus until we introduce competition because suppliers of education, you know, producers of education, whether it be charter schools or whether it be sort of other, you know, private institutions, et cetera, like we don't know what's gonna emerge. Like if we had actual like school choice in Montgomery, like who knows, maybe we would have like 
four or five different you know schools that would come in and tailor themselves to certain demographics like maybe there would be a, a school for kids whose parents don't want to transport them from place to place because that's usually the question is like what about the kids who get left behind right what about the kids who get left behind well in, it depends on how it's done but oftentimes they actually when people when the students leave um, there's actually more money than left in the public school for those kids. So actually, as sort of if you think funding is the issue, then per pupil, they now there's more money because these other kids have left. You have smaller class sizes, etc. But there might also be an educational entrepreneur who comes in and says, "I want to target people who are right in a position where their parents can't." take them you know, five or 10 miles across the city to go to the, uh, the charter school, right? Or maybe those charter schools create some innovative ways in which they bus, or you can't, I don't wanna say bus, but where they, they provide transportation, et cetera, right? For those students to get to their school, right? Carpools, I don't know, something along those lines. And so I oftentimes get asked by progressives, like, well, tell me what it's gonna look like. And I'm like, and as, as sort of a libertarian, a, you know, a classical liberal, someone who believes in markets, it's like, I can't tell you what's gonna be created because if I knew, then I would, you know, like, I would be a poor central. I mean, I'm a, I would be. All of us would be poor central planners. Like, I don't know what's going to emerge. Whatever I imagine, like, should emerge. Like, I imagine the market will produce something like a hundred times better than what I, in my like limitedness, right, could think of as a solution. And so, um, I think it's really, really exciting. But I also think, on a more basic level, um, middle class families and wealthier families have been able to send their kids to the schools of their choice for an extended period of time because they have money. Why shouldn't? Working class moms and dads have a right to send their kids where they want to send their kids. Like on just a more fundamental level, this is um, an injustice and it's in, it is perpetuating past injustices, which we talk about extensively in the book that were caused by large government programs. It's so. also a really good example of public choice theory. Hmm. I mean, you have budgets going up and up and up. We're spending two and a half times what we spent in the 1970s but all of the money is going to uh, administration, right? Administration is just booming. Teachers aren't making that much more. Um, and so we're really seeing that sort of cronyistic kind of corruption in the education system as well. And we're also seeing students try to fight back. Um, we just saw this a few months ago in Baltimore where you had a group of students who literally graduation, high school diploma in hand, who came out reading on the kindergarten level. Um, mm -hmm. No matter how much high school graduation has gone up, which it has shot up tremendously over the past two decades, what we know is that the students who are graduating do not have the skills, the acumen, or quite frankly, the basic education on the reading, writing, math level to succeed in the real world, to even succeed past the elementary school level. So just having a diploma in hand, which again, high schools are giving those things out like candy at this point, doesn't necessarily mean that anything is changing for those young people. And I could talk to you all forever, but we do have some great questions that are from our audience. We'll start here. Oh, sorry, wrong person. Does anybody have questions? In the room? Hello. Hi guys. Hi Stephanie. Um, I'm curious uh, about the, the response you guys have gotten to your book and um, if you ever get any pushback for being two white people writing about black liberation. You know, that's a really, we've been asked that question now uh, four or five times, and every single time we've been asked that question, it's by a white person, uh, so I'll throw that out there. Um, usually it's, it's usually by a white progressive, but, uh, but we're usually asked that question uh, by other white people. It's something that we were concerned about. We, had a, we actually had a paragraph in the introduction um, in which we're like, hey, like, why are we writing this book? Like, we know we're both white. Like, um, you know, like, like kind of apologetic, right? Like, like we took we, it out. You know, we, we ultimately took it out, but we took it out because we did a round table with black scholars and one of the scholars he was like why is this here why is this here you do not need to apologize for writing about black america white people have been writing about black america for a really long time there's lots of really good work by both you know conservative but also uh progressive white scholars there's no reason to apologize for being white uh and writing about black america we care uh we care about individual liberty and that doesn't stop uh you know it's not based on the color of someone's skin right like we care about individual liberty for all Americans. And so we've gotten that question several times. I, what I will say is that the overwhelmingly, the overwhelming response so far, like knock on wood, uh, from reviewers has been overwhelmingly positive and overwhelmingly positive from the black scholars who have engaged with our work up until this point. 
I have to brag a little bit about the tweet the other day. Okay. Because there was a debate on Twitter about us being white, uh, <laughs> authors of the book. And uh, some people argued back and said, well, what about the ideas? You know, engage the ideas. But one person said about a week later, he said, you know, something like, hot take of the day. This book is actually valuable. <laughs> and he was definitely, you know, a left-leaning person. And he said, um, I listened to some of Rachel's videos, and she's clearly a conservative-leaning classical liberal, but she really understands racial inequality. And then he went on to say, do we really want to argue with conservatives about basic facts? Like, do we want to be arguing about the facts of racial inequality, or do we want to have the argument about the solutions, right? And because we don't need to disagree on the facts of racial inequality, uh, we want to disagree on the solutions. And so I thought, hey, this guy gets me, you know? But I thought that was really neat that out of that conversation about why should these people even write this book, he went back and looked and he said, no, she's really taking the history very seriously. And I, I felt that um, that was a good uh, plug. <laughs> yeah, and one of the things that we really want to achieve by writing the book is we think that we can speak to conservatives and libertarians in a way that maybe, you know, we could sit around and wait for someone else to write this book. Um, we could. Uh, it probably would never have gotten written. Um, but you know, we could wait, or we could say, "Listen, we have a unique opportunity to try and um, and try and speak to people in a language that they understand." Right? Uh, conservatives value individual liberty. You know, protection of private property. Um, they recognize that like past injustices should be you know addressed. And so, one of the things we really try to do is you know is to try to take that language that we know, that we speak with conservatives, and we're going to try to get them in, you know, we want them to read the book, and we want to engage with those things and recognize the real, real, real uh, sort of injustice and struggles, right, that black Americans have gone through, so that perhaps some, not saying not all conservatives, but some conservatives will have a little bit more empathy and talk a little bit more intelligently about these issues moving forward. So um, even though we're white, I think we're doing something valuable. <laughs> Just glad that you both can acknowledge the whiteness. <laughs> White as a sheep. We have another question in the room, and then I'm going to go to some of our viewers online. Hello, my name is Everett Bellamy. I, I'm, I'm going to break the trend as a black person asking two white people about the book. I, how much, uh, in, in addition to the black scholars that you collaborated with or got their feedback, how much actually on the ground work that you do in black communities, talking to community leaders, seeing what their daily lives were like as you wrote the current aspects of uh, your book, not, not going back in history, but what's going on today. How much of that kind of work did you do? I would say just organically, I do a lot of that work through several organizations that I'm involved with in St. Louis. So I'm part of a group called Gateway to Flourishing. It's a group of Christian business people who are trying to flip their philanthropic model, right, and do a better job. And so. We are both uh, black and white uh, believers, and we also bring in both black and white speakers. And so I, that's actually how I met Lucas from Love the Lou and met the community there um, on Enright Boulevard. And so a lot of that has happened you know, somewhat organically, and of course it just naturally wove itself into the book. Um, I actually give a little shout out to Lucas in the book itself because I think he's a real hero with the work he's doing there. Um, but the wonderful part is that he's empowering the community members themselves. But yeah, I mean, there's much more to do in terms of having conversations on the ground. Um, I think that's a really important point, actually. We're often in totally separate social networks, right? And so we're all talking to each other, and we're not always talking across. Um, I'm really excited. I'm looking over at Stephanie here because we're going to be next week at the Acton Institute. And one of the things I love about the Acton Institute is that we're talking about religion and liberty, but it's extremely diverse. It's a very diverse group of people. A lot of inner city pastors, actually, because of the organization Made to Flourish, uh, which is dealing with how we can bring economic empowerment uh, to our communities. And so I go to all those luncheons every year at Acton University, and I'm meeting, you know, got people from Detroit and people from various cities. And uh, it's really wonderful, but we need to have more of that, right? We need to be crossing over our socioeconomic barriers, our neighborhood barriers, and our political barriers. And the saddest thing to, that I've seen over the last five years is the way in which the political barriers are going up, right? Those walls are getting higher, and we're talking to one another less, and we're separating ourselves out more. I think that's really, really damaging, and I think classical liberals in particular 
have a good role to play in breaking that down because we never fit in anyway, right? And so we can come and, and push the wall down and, and facilitate those sort of civil conversations across those really tough barriers. But I appreciate your point, you're absolutely right. We need to do as much of that as we can. This question comes from Don online. Why don't black political leaders support charter schools and vouchers that provide better educational opportunities for minorities in inner cities and are eagerly sought after by black parents? Well, I have seen some black political leaders majorly cross the line on this. I mean, I want to give some credit where credit's due. Uh, I, I believe her name is Maria Chappelle Nadal, is a, is a representative in St. Louis who really made people upset by associating herself with the school choice movement, even though she's a very far left uh, person. So I think that does happen and it crosses over more than you think. We're right here in Washington, D.C., which is where Miss Virginia lives, Virginia Walden Ford, who got the Washington, D.C. voucher system into place. And I recommend, uh, I recommend that movie, Miss Virginia, to everybody. It's so good. So I think some have, but I do think that um, the, the pressure from the teachers' unions, remember, I mean, they're the funders of the Democratic Party. If you, if you go and you look at the amount of money that's given, you know, like the top givers to the different parties, the unions are at the top of the list, right? And so it's really hard to go against them. It's just politically, it's very, very difficult to do. And I also want to point out that in Missouri, we have a problem with white rural Republicans saying no to school choice. Because out in rural areas, the unions are the greatest, um, or I should say the public schools, are the greatest employers right, out in, in the rural areas. And so they'll kind of hem and haw and then say no on the floor of the legislature. So it's not, it's not just black political leaders, but I really do, I have to say, blame the unions, the teachers' unions, yeah. On school choice, we'll stick with this. Why do you, what do you think of all school districts? This person is in favor of enabling low-income kids to go to private, but what about allowing those who stay public to choose which public school they go to, regardless of income? Sure, absolutely. I think that it should be completely open and free. Like, if you get a voucher and you want to leave your public school to go to the other public school across the city, I see no reason why the best public school shouldn't win out and the other public schools shouldn't uh, wither on the vine. If that's if that's its sort of you know its its future. I mean, if it's that poor, right? We should empower those. You know, we should send the resources to the institution, the facility that's actually getting results. And if parents think that one school is better than the other school, like I have, I have no problem with that. I think there are some schools that need to fail. That may not be popular to say, but there are some schools that the culture is so bad, it, we would be better off if it died, okay? And we created something from the grassroots up, or you know, from the ground up. Like some things need to die. Some schools should perish. And so like that will happen. And that's actually healthy and good that you know, hopefully we, we could also drive out bad teachers and bad administrators in the process, right? Um, and so I think that that's something that's going to happen with school choice that may not be popular with some school teachers, that may not be popular with some uh, people in the teachers' unions, but I think the reality is, is that we need actual market competition in all aspects of American society, but uh, specifically in education, right, since we're on education, and I think in the process of that, some schools, you know, I, I think that's absolutely perfectly fine. And if a public school ultimately is the best school, better than the charter school, better than the private school, that's fine with me. Like, my mom is a public school teacher. I have no problem, right, with public schools ultimately winning, but they've got to compete in the marketplace. No more sort of, you know, protection for poor districts, poor facilities, poor teachers, et cetera. I think we have another question in the room. I get fired up. Um, I actually have two questions, if that's all right. <laughs> uh, one question actually is a flip of uh, Stephanie's question, which is, what is the conservative response to your book been? Mm. Uh, you know, there are two schools of thought on what's keeping uh, down black progress. Conservatives think it's lack of individual initiative and uh, drive, and of course the progressive response is it's the system, and you're saying it's actually the system comes first, if I understood you correctly. Chronologically. Yeah, chronologically, the system comes first. So what do conservatives say about that? And then the second question is, uh, in terms of school choice and black support for school choice, I'm wondering if, you know, uh, I mean, I, I lived in Michigan and Detroit for a long time, and uh, the first school voucher initiative was, I think it was the first one in 1990s, was actually in Detroit, and it went down in flames, although there was fair amount of black support, but not all of black support. And the reason that, and there was also a lot of opposition in lily white 
suburbs, uh, you know, conservative suburbs. And so there were multiple forces that defeated this initiative. But one reason it didn't have even more black support was because in some ways, uh, the go government is a vehicle for progress for black folks, right? If you can get a job as a teacher or, you know, in a government office, that's your ticket out of, you know, poverty. And so the black, that kind of divides black community because they also see public schools as a way of em employment. So if you can speak to that. Yeah, so um, with regard to, I was gonna go back and talk a little bit about uh, the way that housing affects this debate because of course, I don't know if cartel is the right term, but when you have a school district, you do have the value of your home associated with the district, right? And so that's not really just in some sense, um, but, uh, but that's the case at the moment. And so there's a status quo that I think is gonna be really hard to overcome and that's where you get to the Lily White, right? Thinking about how is this gonna affect my home values if the district is different, right, from what it is right now. And so I think just to be realistic about the public choice issues that are in front of us, and one of the reasons why we need to keep that momentum going, because we've got to push through some of those obstacles. Um, but yeah, I'm familiar with this, and I just want to take a moment to go back in the history again uh, to see why we got to where we are at. And one of the reasons is because, quite frankly, and Paul Moreno talks about this in his book about African Americans and the unions, the private unions were deeply and persistently racist. And this is like a story that just goes on and on and on and you see like tiny little efforts and they peter out. And so what you have is a situation in which many black people never were able to take advantage of the sorts of manufacturing jobs and things like that that were dominated by unions. And I, we do not disagree with the idea of unions, right? You can always negotiate as a group, but we have some laws in the United States that empower unions in a way that, that changes the power dynamics and makes things a little unfair. And of course, if your union is all white and you have something like the Davis-Bacon Act where everything that the federal government does has to be done through a union, then no black people can work on that job, right? No black people can work to build the highway because the union is building the highway. So what does that mean? That means that public, the, the, the government areas have often been ahead of the game, right? So the, uh, for instance, the desegregating of the army, right, of the military, uh, which became a great source of opportunity for black Americans. And I think public unions have had that effect too. So we have to go back and look how we got here, right? And the way in which we have to own up to some of this racist history and some of it's progressive, right? It's progressive racism. I think that's really important to point out because we have this kind of stereotype of conservative racists and progressives who love, uh, love minorities, but the history is not like that at all. Um, that, that sort of eugenics mentality is coming out of the progressive era. So I think that's important to say. Um, so far, we've gotten very good responses from conservatives. I think that thoughtful conservatives are willing to tell a more nuanced story. Um, you know, especially if you're willing to blame progressives a little bit, right? Because they're kind of tired of getting beat up and told that they're racist all the time. So if you go, I go, no, actually everybody was pretty racist, right? And so both sides. Um, and so they, they're attracted to that point. They're attracted to the critique of, of the big government, right? The big government projects. And so you can sort of get them to finally admit some of this historical racial injustice uh, by, by who you blame, right? And so I think that really helps, actually. It helps conservatives to tell a better, more nuanced story, but we're not totally disagreeing with them in terms of cultural breakdown, particularly in these very isolated areas either, right? Yes, we want agency, we want grit, we want to tell these kids that they can, uh, that they have hope, right? That they can make it in the United States, but we can't say that if we're not coming into the neighborhood and surrounding them with resources. Because the truth is, is it's unrealistic to think you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps in that isolated of a situation. Yeah, on the, on the question of how conservatives have received um, the book, um, I will say that uh, the Philadelphia Society, which was founded in 1964, 65 by uh, Don Lipschitz, uh, Milton Friedman, mm -hmm. uh, William F. Buckley, Etc. invited Rachel to come and speak, uh, you know, to give um, a talk at the Philadelphia Society about sort of um, race and covenant, right? Sort of this sort of, and they had that as one of the one of the panels. I was really proud to see that 
um, and the Philadelphia Society's uh, program. Um, and I think they're very thoughtful conservatives, most of the people who attend the Philadelphia Society. And um, we had our ginormous uh, sort of, you know, poster of the book there, and like people came around, and we got tons of positive feedback, right? And so I, don't, I will say we haven't gotten a ton of, of reviews yet from conservative, conservative publications, but um, National Review plans to review the book, so we'll see. Um, and the Imaginative Conservative. That's they, right, and plan coming. to review the book. And, and so I, I think the reviews will be positive, and I think that the story that we're telling offers conservatives a narrative in which they can address past injustice um, while not jettisoning the sort of principles of America. Because I think many conservatives feel very threatened by what they perceive to be sort of CRT, the 1619 Project. They see American exceptionalism, American greatness under assault. And I think we want to, we're very realistic about America in the book. But one of the things we say is that it's not our liberal founding that's to blame. It's not liberalism that's to blame. The folks who say that on the left are wrong. Liberalism is not to blame. Liberalism is the answer to our problems. It's not the cause of our problems. We failed to live up to our liberalism. We failed to live up to our ideals. We failed to protect black Americans, right? We failed to extend the rule of law to them. And so by providing conservatives with this, we might, I don't know if we want to call it a third way, uh, a third type of narrative, I think what, I hope what we're providing them is a way in which they can retain their belief in America Mm -hmm. and the promise of America while doing right by their neighbors and by the people who mm -hmm. were wronged, right, by, mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of injustice that occurred in the past. So I'm really hopeful. Um, we'll see. Um, we'll see how it goes. Hopefully this event helps, right? Get out the word. Uh, so. The best line is Frederick Douglass's, right, when he says, it's not the Constitution, but whether we have honor enough and courage enough to live up to our Constitution. Next question from our online viewers. What are your opinions on systemic racism? Does it exist? Yeah, so I think, I mean, that's a really thorny question. I think it comes down to like, what do you mean by systemic uh, when we're talking about systemic racism? I would generally tend to say like, I agree. I agree that systemic racism exists in the country. I think that it is embedded within, I mean, we definitely see it in outcomes. I mean, if you're looking at young black men who are, you know, who's, who are brought in for sort of like drug charges versus young white men, um, this may be partially socioeconomic, but I think it's partially racial as well. Uh, they tend to be incarcerated at much higher numbers than, than the young white men. So the young white kids. So like, why is that the case, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that we have um, impediments that disproportionately disadvantage people who are working class. Um, and because of, you know, sort of systemic and explicit racism that has occurred in the past, oftentimes uh, by government policy, people have been, you know, basically these folks don't have access to these resources and so it continues to harm those communities. And so I think that we have a hangover from hundreds of years. I mean, we're talking hundreds upon hundreds of years of injustice. That is not going to be solved overnight. Even if we get every single thing that we want in terms of policy, we get educational freedom, we get an end to the war on drugs, all right? We get um, sort of mass, every one of you go out to your communities and you like make a fundamental difference and we have transitional justice. Like it's still going to take transitional justice and a neighborhood stabilization. It's still going to take time to, um, to right the wrongs that have existed in the past. Now when I say, you know, yeah, I think we have systemic, so we have systemic issues. Um, yeah, I think part of that's in law that needs to be changed through legislation, um, et cetera, in the case of the war on drugs. I don't think that the American project or liberalism in and of itself is necessarily tied to racism, which I think is something that people who advocate, some advocates for, like saying, yes, I'm for systemic, uh, I believe systemic uh, injustice exists, and I think it's tied directly to liberalism. I don't believe that at all, right? I think it's sort of like the illiberal aspects that are holdovers from, you know, uh, systems, economic systems of exploitation, et cetera, that continue to haunt us to this day. And what we've got to do is try and right those wrongs and give everybody an actual equal opportunity. Yeah, I think one of the points of the book is to not have a monocausal mm. sort of story, right? We have to be able to be nuanced. We have to be able to bring in all of the various causes. So yes, of course we acknowledge the existence of systemic racism, but we also don't totalize that as the only interesting explanation for anything that, that is wrong with us, right, as a country. And so we just want to complicate that and add more information to that, but we do want to acknowledge it. We hear a lot about black banking in books such as The Color of Money and how the lack of banks owned by blacks has contributed to racial wealth inequality. 
What role has the banking system played in perpetuating injustice, if at all, and what can be done to mend these injustices? Okay, this is huge. So we actually just got a really glowing review from uh, the American Institute for Economic Research, um, and he had one, one critique, um, which had to do with uh, what we would do. It was actually about reparations, but it had to do with what you would do with that money. And he was pointing this out, actually, that going in and supporting black banking would actually be a really, really powerful way of lifting up the black community for the very reasons that you're talking about. And I gotta tell you, this is a good example of actually multi-causal explanations because you have this terrible history, but then you also have what's going on right now that's just regulatory stupidity. Mm. So you have this situation after the 2008 financial crisis in which the new regulations have made it impossible to have any small banks. There are no new small banks. It's very hard to even have community credit unions. You now can't even get a small home loan for a little starter home because they can't afford to process your loan unless it's way bigger than that, right? And so we are just crushing anyone who's starting from you know, a, a low starting point from even getting onto the economic rung, right? The economic ladder, getting onto the bottom rung of the economic ladder. And so what, that's a really good example of the ways in which Yes, there's historic injustice, but there's also just bad policy. And it has a bad effect on a community that's already vulnerable because of historic injustice, right? And so then that community is like, hello, you know, help us, okay? And so I think we can tell that story where we can show that it's not always racist intent necessarily, but can have terrible disparate effects, right? And so that kind of gets back to that question about systemic racism. Is it systemically racist that they have a regulatory system that's crushing the poor in terms of home ownership? Well, not necessarily in terms of intent, but if it has that outcome, what do we call it, right? Well, it's just stupid. I don't know what we should call it, but it's not a good idea. So yes, banking is a huge area in which I think we could improve, but we're stuck with terrible, terrible regulations that are making any small experiments almost impossible. And that's a case where it's very hard to even create a civil society workaround because you can't. You're not allowed. And black banks were created out of the same spirit that HBCUs were created, and today all of those are virtually gone. Mm -hmm. like they, they pretty much got swallowed up after the crash of 08. Um, many of them were underwater with homes that they had took on in communities that were of, of low, lower economic value. And they some ended up consolidating, but for the most part, People who depended on those banks really don't have any place else to go right now. And I think one of the points we make in the section on economic freedom is that people really underestimate the extent to which economic growth helps the poor. And economic recessions are the hardest on the poor, right? It was the poor who didn't recover from the recession after 2008 until way past 2015, while the middle and upper classes were trotting along just fine. And so I think in a lot of people's minds, they think about economic freedom and they think about economic growth and they figure it's just a bunch of fat cat CEOs. And we're like, listen, if their bank account gets bigger or, or a little smaller, that's not meaning a lot to them, right? But if you suddenly shut down a major part of the economy because you've had a major recession, it changes your whole life if you've lost your job. Right? If you can't buy a house, if you can't open a small bank, if you can't go to the community credit union and get a small loan, that changes your whole life trajectory. So we need to get it out of our heads that economic growth is something rich people care about. We need to care about it for the sake of poor people. Yeah, if anything, it matters for the poor more, right? Far more um, marginal I try utility. To make that, I get really excited in class when I show graphs and show like 4% growth rates. I'm like, you all should be so excited by this graph, right? And the students are like, what is he talking about? <laughs> I'm like, no, because this means that you can save for your kid's college fund. Like, you all don't have, you know, most of my students don't have children, but I'm like, this is really important. One of the things I want to say on, on black banking is that if, if you're interested in this, there's some, uh, I, one of the books that we draw on is my advisor's book, uh, Black Maverick, which is about um, sort of a forgotten civil rights ad activist, T.R.M. Howard, who uh, protected Emmett Till's uh, mother and family during the trial and other things like that. But he was also really, really key in sort of um, whites tried to use the banking system as a means by which to crush basically um, black activism after um, the decision over Brown v. Board. And, um, and that book is, ha has just a few pages, but five or six pages in the ways in which Black Americans pulled resources and through through the banking establishments that they had set up to basically outlast right uh, the citizens is it the Citizens League the Citizens Council sorry the white you know sort of the white sort of you know I don't 
what you want to call them, vigilante group that's trying to like basically shut down and freeze out black Americans from the economy to get them to be quiet about like political protests. And so there's some really amazing stories historically about the role that black banks played in enabling right, the civil rights movement, activism, um, et cetera. And it's a pity that, as you say, like many of those banks no longer uh, exist. We have a question in the room. Hi, um, my name is Sinatra Kapala Foster. Um, so you spoke a lot about the empowering and driving force of the black church, especially for empowering nature. Um, do you highlight the groups that were empowered by the black church, even within their own communities, mm -hmm. mainly due to their gender, sexuality? And then from a historical standpoint, um, well, first, you said there was a decline of black millennials who are religious. Do you think it correlates? and? and what is the civil society workaround, as you like to call it, in order to incorporate the black church within these communities so it can become more empowering within the 21st century? That's a controversial question. I have to tell you, and Marcus and I may take different, different perspectives on this question. Um, so I'll give you an example. Um, the PBS special on the black church, um, Henry Gates, right, in Sesame. Um, the first three quarters, I loved. I thought he told the story that I told in chapter five, right? Uh, just this, this incredibly empowering source of self-esteem. And then in the last quarter, he made the point you're making. Um, he said, you know, these churches aren't progressive enough. They're not socially progressive enough on issues of gender and sexuality. And it's kind of an intersectionality point, right? Uh, that if there's a form of oppression happening, other oppressed groups have to all band together. And I didn't appreciate it, personally. Um, I thought, you know, you just spent three quarters of this telling us the power of this tradition, which holds scripture in a very, very high uh, way, right? Uh, broad interpretation, but very, very high view of scripture. And um, it goes deep, theologically, and so to say, like, you guys just need to toss off this whole ethical area <laughs> that you get from your theology, I don't think that's fair, and it feels sort of mercenary. Like, if I'm going to support black people after all that they've been through, I need them to give up something that's central to them in their faith in order for me to be on their side. I don't want to do that. I, I think black suffering in America is unique. Um, it's uniquely terrible part of our history. And I, I don't feel right um, asking the black church to do that. And so I think we probably will just have separate civil society institutions. Um, I mean, there will be black churches who will go progressive, of course, but it's true that the black church in general tends to be conservative in those areas. And I just wanna honor that. And you know, as a classical liberal, people have different ways of life that they're pursuing and sources of meaning. And, um, and so I want to let that uh, proceed as it, as it is. But, but I don't know if you disagree or agree on that, Marcus. No, I think that what I was going to say is simply that, you know, I'm sure there will be black theologians who take a more sort of, you know, who, who take the opposite sort of view or, the, or who want to support folks, yeah. right? Who, yeah, for uh, sure. Yeah, and I think those, those, that will emerge. And then I think that those people who support those initiatives and that sort of reading of the theology or... Uh, you know, and whatnot, we'll, we'll do so, and then, those, and then that civil society can grow. And so I think it can be built, right? It may not be connected to, um, you know, and this is the chapter that Rachel the more worked, you know, the more traditional black church, but it can be a new form of civil society that grows out of and borrows some things from, but deviates in other ways. And I think that that is perfectly, I mean, it's obviously perfectly legitimate. And, and one of the things that's so great about liberalism, right? Um, I'm teaching 19th century Europe to my, you know, next semester, and I am not a specialist in 19th century Europe. Uh, yeah. And uh, I've just been really, really, it's really profound to see the ways in which liberalism created civil society in Europe where it had not existed prior. Um, and so like in a liberal society, like this is what we do, right? Like we don't all have to go to the same club, right? We don't all have to be part of the same, uh, you know, the same church. We don't all have to, you know, do X, Y, or Z. Um, we have tolerance for one another, we can build our own civil societies, and that's what I was going to say. I mean, whether it's within the church or outside of the church, right, um, I think that, you know, it's worthwhile to build civil society that supports those folks um, as they, you know, try to uh, experience flourishing, so.
<laughs> they're, they're huge. <laughs> Miscommunication. Hi, my name is Nicole Nahosa. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on Tulsa's Black Wall Street in relation to um, liberation through the marketplace. Yeah, so Tulsa offers a, like sort of a word of caution to libertarians. Um, markets are not enough. Mm -hmm. Markets are not enough. Entrepreneurship is not enough. If you don't have the rule of law, if you know the government does not protect private property, if the government and the police do not like arrest people who are based, they, they're terrorists. Let's be real. The people, the people who got had a Gatling gun and were in planes shooting people were domestic terrorists, okay? Like they are the, the vigilante army. And so what we see in Tulsa is it's, it's beautiful. I'm, it, the, the, the community is beautiful. Greenwood is beautiful and vibrant. I've been teaching um, a book called The Burning by Tim Madigan for I think eight years or so. I was so happy when like, you know, it was included in what the HBO is, The Watchmen, right? Like so my students might actually finally know a little bit about it before they came to my class. But I've been teaching it for like eight years. And the first half of the book is about the beauty of the entrepreneurship and the civil society and the prosperity in Tulsa. And there's still an unequal relationship with whites, like many people cross the train tracks to go into white Tulsa, right? There's still segregation, which was imposed by the top down by the state, by the way, it's an interesting history. There was more intermingling until uh, Oklahoma became a state. And then all of a sudden, once it became a state, they had a state legislature, which then put into effect Jim Crow laws. Um, so it's interesting how that became very rigid. But Greenwood was beautiful. And then it was destroyed. Why was it destroyed? It was destroyed because those people did exactly what Rachel and I would want them to do, right? Exactly what Booker T. Washington would have wanted them to do. They put down their bucket. They uh, went and they did their job and they were great at it. They were the best doctors, right? People, the white folks would come over and, and get help from the, the black doctor. And they did what they were supposed to do. They worked hard, they got ahead, they created businesses. And then white envy reared its nasty head. And so I think Tulsa is a cautionary tale to libertarians that like, well, not, I mean, sometimes libertarians just, I don't want to, ah, I'm not Cato. Anyways, point being, right, like, like they think like, you know, like, oh, the markets will just solve it. Like, well, no, we have to have the rule of law, right? And I think most libertarians recognize that. They have to have the rule of law, right? Um, without private property protections, like you can be as entrepreneurial as you want to. Um, and white envy is something that I think that, you know, we really had to grapple with in the book. It's like, you know, black Americans oftentimes, this happened in Memphis, right? Uh, with, with Ida B. Wells. Like, this happened time and time and time again. And what it was is a failure of, um, of Americans to live up to our liberal values. That's what we say. This is not, you know, this is not an indictment of American liberalism. It's not an Just, indictment of that system. It is, it is, is a failure of the individuals to live up to the system. And I, I would do. interject a little because I feel like the, the rule of law is great in, a, in the mind frame and in thought, but the rule of law across many states has actually served to either not punish the individuals who create this vigilante justice for themselves or to make it more open for others to do the same thing in other areas where you see there is black economic progress. Laws were actually put in place to protect them, not to protect those who they were abusing. So rule of law for me, and I think for a lot of black people, is the idea that um, it, it's the rule of law for certain people, typically not us. And it often falls on us, the honor is to protect ourselves and figure out a way through it because the law, whether it is imposed locally or by the state, and in some cases, at least historically, at the federal level, has not necessarily been provisions that were extended to the protection of us and our property. Yeah, yeah, I agree that, with that 100 percent. Absolutely. I, I was on a Liberty Fund kind of round table for Black History Month, and we all sort of answered each other's essays. And this exact point was made by one of the black authors who answered me. She said, make sure you say the rule of just law. Mm. Because I think in our circles we say, oh, rule of law, and we know what we mean, which mm -hmm. is like actually universally applied law. But um, not everyone reads it that way, as you just pointed out. And so I told her, I said, I'm going to say the rule of just law from now on to make sure everybody understands what I mean, because you're absolutely right. Oh, I wanted to make one more point about envy, too, which is just that you talked about rule of just law, but we also need to talk about culture. And, and part of a, a liberal culture mm -hmm. is that we see, our, we see ourselves as having a lot of win-win situations, that we can cooperate and make one another better off and have exchange for mutual advantage. And we, and we don't... Um, conceive of things in terms of a zero-sum game. And that's what envy does, because it's a status good, right? So I have to be above you. And so really, envy is incompatible with a liberal society. And I believe we have time for one more. Uh, yes. Well, wait, oh, somebody, else awesome too. somebody is back here. So we'll go ahead and get you as well. Okay. Chelsea Follett, thank you so much for this talk. 
Um, the current national mood is incredibly pessimistic with regards to racial disparities and race relations. Are there any current trends related to that liberatory potential of the market that are uplifting that you can share? That's a great point. Um, we're, not at a, we're not at a very wonderful moment <laughs> culturally when it comes to this conversation. I do want to say that I think there may be a purgative element to what we're going through right now. Um, sometimes you can get to a point where like you're sort of finally safe enough to, to express how much pain you're in, if you know what I mean, to use therapeutic terms, and that may be what's happening right now um, as we're having this conversation. I do think culturally we're seeing a lot of good things like groups like Braver Angels, right? These sorts of groups that are trying to have these conversations across um, barriers. I think that's really wonderful. And I do think, you know, the idea of sort of black owned businesses, right? And, and supporting one another and that return to the group economy. I think some conservatives get really nervous. They don't like that idea because we're making that black white distinction. But I think when you know the history and you realize that there's been so many setbacks, why not put special emphasis on supporting black owned businesses? So that movement I think could, could make a big difference. But um, that's something to keep our eye out for, you know, moments of of sort of hope. And of course, I, I absolutely think that the flip towards neighborhood stabilization, which really is gaining momentum. I mean, you're seeing a lot of like nonprofit administration programs reading these books and realizing we're doing philanthropy wrong. We need to flip our model. I think the more we can get that to spread, the more churches we can send to the Chalmers Center and get them to switch what they're doing, the better we're going to be in terms of really sparking that entrepreneurship in those areas that need to be revitalized. John Burrow, Competitive Enterprise Institute, thank you for uh, presenting. I look forward to reading the book. Uh, uh, my question is, um, what, wasn't there somewhat after the, the Tulsa massacre, somewhat of a comeback with Greenwood, but then that was destroyed by, oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, uh, but then that was destroyed by urban renewal? Do you know that story? So I think, you know, I generally leave Tulsa in my class you know, after the burning, we, the, the, the book has a, an epilogue where it talks about like the forgetting that took place in Tulsa and the ways in which black and white American, or white Tulsans forgot about the burning. Um, black, black Tulsans because they were um, petrified and you know, probably mm -hmm. had some, you know, something resembling PTSD about the event and many of those families just left, right? They just left Tulsa. And so I think that, I think you're right uh, to the extent that like Greenwood did come, to, come back to a certain extent um, but it's never going to be the thriving place that it once was because so many people had thought of it as, I mean, Ida B. Wells even goes out to Oklahoma when she leaves Memphis and she says, you know, this has been told that this is the promised land, right? And she goes out there and she goes, eh, I don't think so. <laughs> Basically, she's like, if you want to go out there, that's fine. But like, it's not, what is it? you're being sold in the pamphlets is not correct. Um, uh, and so I think that like after the burning, um, I don't think it ever really gets back to the status that it was before. And I can't really, I can't speak to urban renewal in Tulsa. I don't know that story um, yeah, I, specifically. So the, we draw on two books, The Color of Law by Richard Roth, Rothstein, who deals a lot with FHA redlining, but he does deal with highways to some extent and urban renewal as well. And then specifically um, on highways, we, do, we deal with Eric Avila's uh, Folklore of the Freeway. Mm -hmm. So I recommend those books. Um, he does go over several cities. I'm not remembering Tulsa in particular. Yeah, but it wouldn't surprise um, yeah. me at yeah, all. It, it would not surprise me at all. And, Highway through Greenwood and hmm. urban renewal that destroyed. There's, I, mean, I just use like, Google as a yeah. there's an article in Smithsonian Magazine that's been like decades after Tulsa Race Massacre, urban renewal has sparked Black Wall Street yeah. second destruction. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay, so another round. And, I, and I'm not surprised at all because it happens in every major American city. Uh, yeah. I mean, it just does because they're handed millions and millions of dollars by the federal government, yeah. um, you know, to with racist intent. So. Yeah, and one last like comment on like, is, are there things that are happening that are positive? And I think one of the things that's happening that's really positive is what's happening in Tulsa now. It's an example of uh, transitional justice, right? Where yeah. the community is coming together. We're actually getting a sense of how many people lost their lives, right, in the burning, um, and the, there's a recognition of mm -hmm. the past injustice, which is necessary for reconciliation. There cannot be any reconciliation without recognition of past injustice. And conservatives that want to move, well, let's just move on. No, 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 no. We don't get to move on until we acknowledge right, uh, the past. And Tulsa's doing that as a community. There was some pushback to it, but I think that those types of efforts at transitional justice, which we talk about in the solutions chapter, um, that's good, right? It's good to have those conversations. So um, I think that's quite promising.
Well, thank you both. And for those that are here, as well as those that are listening at home or at work or wherever you're listening, where can people purchase your book? Amazon.com, 18 bucks. We, we tried to make it as uh, approachable as possible, both in, in uh, readability and in price. So it's a, a paperback, a straight to paperback. And uh, you can follow me at Liberty Ethics on Twitter, um, friend me, link in, whatever you want to do. And I'm also posting everything I write at rachelfergusononline.com. You can also find me on Twitter. I'm not extraordinarily active. I'm not a big <laughs> fan of Twitter. I think it's a cesspool. But if, you, if you're polite and comment oh, to me, then I, then I might respond. Uh, but I'm also at Twitter at Marcus Witcher, so quite easy. Um, Throughout this, we have found out that Marcus does not like Twitter or TikTok. Um, <laughs> he's a curmudgeon. He's an old soul. He's yeah, an old yeah. Soul. I'd much rather be in my garden, right? Like, <laughs> Thank you both so much, and thanks to the Cato Institute for hosting this amazing event. Paul? So thank you all for your time. Hope you all enjoyed. And thank you all to our panelists for being absolutely lovely. I just want one last round of applause to them. <laughs> Always lovely to see. And we're going to go downstairs now for some food and drink and some chatting. So thanks again. Thank you.